Good morning, all comrades and friends. Um, I know that uh, one doesn't necessarily have to go to a country uh, to form ideas about it that, that are accurate, and in some cases condemnatory. I never went to apartheid South Africa, but I've no doubt at all from the range of reports from inside and outside the country that this was an evil regime that had to be opposed and overthrown. Um, but I am nevertheless astonished by the, the number of people, uh, particularly, uh, I suppose one could say, those who read The Guardian, who have such hard and fast opinions about China, and not only have never been there, not an essential qualification, but clearly know next to nothing about the country as it actually is. Um, because going to a country does at least give you uh, an accurate idea of what you see and hear, provided you do so, of course, with a, a, an inquisitive mind. Um, I did a brief item on Radio Cymru, the Welsh language, BBC Welsh language channel the other day about the centenary of the CPC. And um, uh, I, I was invited to speak first and uh, I gave a potted history, if you like, of, uh, the, of the 100 years of the CPC, but in particular, its achievements. Um, it was all over in about a minute. And then they turned to a businessman based in Shanghai, the vice president of the Cola Company, a United States multinational. And uh, they asked him whether, in fact, I had not given a completely inaccurate uh, and uh, highly optimistic picture of China and its achievements. I'd already been challenged by the, by the interviewer on that, but hadn't given, had any opportunity really to respond. Well, his response was, uh, in Welsh, of course, well, uh, Robert is absolutely spot on in what he is saying. And that uh, vice president went on to describe aspects of life and society in modern China that uh, chimed completely with my own uh, impressions and made it very clear to the interviewer um, that uh, what the characteristics ascribed to Chinese society and the Chinese people were so fundamentally at variance with the truth that he, had expe that he experienced this for himself, that they quite frankly, they couldn't, they couldn't wait to close down the item quickly enough. Um, uh, I won't recite all the points that he made, uh, but he did make it clear that the Chinese people uh, are not some poor downtrodden mass that needs to be liberated by the imposition of a Western capitalist model of liberal democracy. Um, uh, but uh, I, I think perhaps the, 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 the most appropriate contribution I, I could make to uh, this morning would be just to draw on some of my experiences there in three particular areas. Um, first of all, um, the environment uh, and environmental questions. Um, secondly, my visit to Xinjiang province, the Uyghur province. And thirdly, perhaps a little bit about uh, militarism and so-called Chinese military expansion. One of the enormous areas of progress and development that I saw in many different parts of China on, uh, on multiple occasions uh, was the enormous were the enormous advances being made in terms of the uh, of the environment and uh, China's ecosystem. I visited an old industrial village, for example, that had been a center of um, the iron industry. Uh, we have these old iron villages, of course, here in Britain, descended from the Industrial Revolution. The enormous effort that had gone into not only cleaning up that whole area on a scale that I have rarely seen attempted, let alone achieved in Britain, um, but in fact, all of the local villages uh, now lived in the most modern spacious houses that most people in Britain could only dream of living in. Um, this wasn't a show village, by the way. I saw other, we traveled through other villages that looked exactly the same, all with solar paneling, uh, all with the latest mod cons and technology. We visited the houses. We talked to the people who lived in them. It was quite spectacular. 
Um, we visited one of the most technologically advanced uh, waste disposal plants. Um, I chaired a campaign uh, in, in uh, Splot in Cardiff, where I was living. I chaired the campaign against the sighting of a giant incinerator right next to uh, these residential areas. Uh, and I must say, if it had had the technology that I saw at work in, in China, uh, I might have perhaps not campaigned quite so hard because I saw a whole number of processes being applied in order to minimize the carbon emissions and to make the maximum use of that waste in terms of producing um, uh, energy uh, and other uh, sources of power um, for, uh, for, for surrounding communities and businesses. Um, in many cities and, play, uh, and, and outlying villages, I saw solar panelling, for example, a standard feature on all new housing. And the scale of house building, of course, in China has again been something that we haven't seen in Britain, probably in our history, and certainly not seen since the 1950s and before that during the Industrial Revolution. I saw giant wind farms um, uh, on our visit to Xinjiang province, a few miles outside the capital city, by far the biggest wind farm I've ever seen in my life, powering the city itself and surrounding villages and so on. Uh, and I know that, uh, of course, it, and this has received some publicity, China has been building five very large eco-cities um, where the, uh, the end result will be um, uh, will, will be carbon neutral. Again, something far more ambitious than we've ever attempted here in Britain. The only downside was that much of the technology to begin that work had actually been supplied by German companies. I asked whether or not there couldn't have been British companies involved, and they said, unfortunately, British companies in that field and in other fields have been banned from exporting that technology in China because the United States believed that some of it could be turned to military use. That's something, of course, that receives no coverage in the media in Britain. We saw the developments in public transport, railway lines thousands of miles long, stretching across China, new stations, again, of a splendor that I haven't seen the equivalent uh, anywhere in, in, in Britain, and, unless we're talking about Victorian architecture. The city of, uh, the super city of Zhenzhen was particularly interesting, uh, just, on the, just uh, on the border with, uh, uh, the, the physical border with Hong Kong. And again, there, a new city has been built up around the old. And what was particularly spectacular, and, and quite rightly, our Chinese host boasted of this, um, nowhere in the city was more than a couple of minutes walk from a park or a garden uh, and for a public transport uh, mini hub where different forms of public transport would be available. Um, so, uh, and again, the parks and gardens that were everywhere um, that are, are, are an essential part of the residential and commercial development that one sees. Very quickly, my visitors in Jiang I had told the, um, the, radio, the Radio Cymru researchers that I must be one of the few people they, they, they will ever interview who's actually been to Xinjiang, uh, the Uyghur province, and perhaps they might like to ask me a question about that. Well, I thought perhaps quite significantly they didn't. But once more, I haven't been there recently, and therefore I can't comment from personal experience about the claims that are made in the West uh, of supposed genocide against the Uyghurs and so on. But I have learned this. When, we were, when our delegation from the Communist Party of Britain, four of us, went to Xinjiang and the capital Urumqi and outlying villages, uh, when we were in the capital city, we weren't accompanied everywhere, we weren't chaperoned anywhere. We had a free morning on one occasion and we decided just to go for a general stroll. We went to the local market, bustling, large market. Everywhere we went, we heard the Uyghur language being spoken. Uh, it's recognizable to Western ears, even if we don't speak Uyghur and don't speak Han Chinese. It's a Turkish-based language. Sounds completely different 
to uh, Han Chinese, Mandarin, and so on. Um, we heard it everywhere. We heard it in the marketplace. We heard it in the streets. All of these signs, the public signs and notices, were in the Uyghur language together with Han Chinese, usually Han Chinese second, and uh, occasionally in Russian, because there has been a large Russian uh, uh, community there in the past. Um, when we met the leaders of the party and of the city council, separate meetings, our interpreters from Beijing had to stand down. Special interpreters had to be found locally who could interpret from the Uyghur language into English and back again, because most of the municipal and party leaders that we met uh, spoke Uyghur as their first language and were much more comfortable speaking to us in Uyghur. So after these experiences, we got back to Britain and within days, and I've put the precise details of the date uh, of a report in The Guardian that we read of a speech that had been delivered in the European Parliament by the president of the World Uyghur Congress, uh, a congress supposedly of Uyghur people in exile. And uh, this president of the World Uyghur Congress, funded, of course, by the United States National Endowment for Democracy, he told the European parliamentarians how terrible the conditions were in Xinjiang because the Uyghur language was banned. It was a criminal offence to speak it. All of the road signs and public notices are in Han Chinese only, and all of the top officials in the government and the uh, Communist Party in Xinjiang were Han Chinese. Well, the four of us had just got back from Xinjiang. We knew for a fact this was completely and utterly untrue. I probably wrote a letter to The Guardian about it. I suspect it was never published. I don't recall it being published. But we had seen the complete opposite of the truth. Now, it's possible our Chinese hosts could have constructed some kind of uh, some kind of fairyland city for us and peopled it with Uyghur speakers and put up notice boards everywhere, but I don't think so. The, the moral of the story is not that I know for certain what's happening in Xinjiang today. The moral of the story is do not take at face value, please do not take at face value what you read in or hear in the Western media about Xinjiang the Uyghurs, or for that matter, almost anything else that is happening in China. My final point, if I may, uh, perhaps on a more political note, we do hear a lot in the West about so-called Chinese expansionism and so on. And uh, no report, it seems to me, um, comes from China, from Sky or the BBC and so on, unless there's at least a mention of Tiananmen Square and, uh, 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 and the so-called massacre. Uh, and uh, uh, at least uh, plenty of film of Chinese troops marching up and down. Um, the reality, of course, is something very different. Uh, the whole idea of Chinese expansionism into the South China Sea, of course, is rather absurd when you just stop to think of it for a moment. Even more absurd is the idea that uh, British and US and NATO military forces are in the South China Sea and they're in the Asia Pacific in order to counter Chinese expansionism. That appears to be the reason why our military bases and our military forces are all across the world, whereas China has no, not a single military base outside its own borders. We have them across the world and we are parading in our warships across the South China Sea supposedly to stop uh, Chinese military expansionism. It rather reminds me of something I read not, uh, not, not so long ago about uh, Chinese and Russian expansionism. Why is it they insist on putting their national borders right next to all our military bases? Um, the whole idea is nonsensical, but of course it's to whip up an anti-China psychosis, an anti-China frenzy. And uh, we have to try and combat that. And I'll, I'll perhaps leave you with, with this, this fact. I researched this this morning. I'm not the first person to do it. But I looked up the latest estimates from the Stockholm International Institute for Peace Research. And it confirms that in 2020, the year of the pandemic, 
when there's, there was so much that we needed to do with our human and uh, financial resources, the first year of the pandemic, I should say. The United States spent more on its military program than the next 12 countries combined, and that includes China. It spent twice as much of its massive GDP, more than twice as much of its GDP, on military uh, uh, on military expenditure, expenditure than China did. So again, these reports of whether it's genocide in Xinjiang, whether it's the poor downtrodden people of China, I must admit I didn't see many people who fitted that category on any of my five, six or seven visits, or whether it's so-called Chinese expansionism. I would just urge everybody, um, uh, find alter read, read the Western propaganda by all means. We have no option but to see it on our television and hear it, uh, hear it on the radio. But also read other sources. Read sources from inside China, read other sources from outside China. Read sources and hear reports from people in the West who've actually been there and traveled and met Chinese people, discussed with them, and seen at least some of the evidence for their own eyes. Um, thanks very much for, for listening.